Fine. <clears throat> so, a 33-year-old comes in short of breath for six hours. She's got sharp pleurotic chest pain localised to her right. It's no cough, no fever. Uh, she's on the COCP, ECG showing signs tacky. What are you thinking of? P. P. Okay. Cool. What are you can prescribe straight away? <laughs> like, what are you going? If that's your clinical diagnosis, if that's your impression. Oxygen. Um, yes, yeah, oxygen. Routinely or like, even for a certain range or. Um, about ninety. Oh, oh, it's ninety-six percent. Yeah. Ninety-six percent. Um, so the BTS. <coughs> basically. Okay, so what we can do is there's basically. Four. <laughs> <laughs> we're running out of numbers, but um, no, there's um. It's basically three main groups, okay? There's the critically unwell. If you've got a ridiculously unwell patient, you just slap on high flow oxygen. You don't think about SATs, okay? Um, in most, and that's usually, you know, cardiac arrests or severe, uh, status epilepticus or um, you know, trauma patients, something really kind of extreme. And that's kind of a holding measure until you know what's really going on, okay? Then you've got kind of one step down where you've got patients who might need oxygen. These are people who are, uh, who can fall into one of two groups, okay? You split them into patients who are at risk of hypercapnic failure, and those not at risk. So, who's at risk of hypercapnic failure? CFD. CFD, that's one. Okay, who else? Heart failure? Heart failure is not so much. If you've got pure isolated heart failure, you're not at risk. Okay. Okay. Hypo, you say? Hypercapnic. Hypercapnic, yeah. Hypercapnic. They've got high CO2. Yeah, so if someone is hypercapnic, what's. Okay, there's basically two problems you can get in ventilation, in, um, in respiration. You either have oxygen, oxygenation problems, or ventilation problems. Okay. If you've got CO2 going up, what type of problem have you got? Um, ventilation. Yeah, ventilation problems. So these are basically patients who can't ventilate very well. Okay. Million bar, yeah, perfect. Million Neuromuscular, problems. perfect. So neuromuscular people are just as much at risk as, or well, probably more than most COPD patients. Anyone else? People who won't be able to. Like myasthenia gross. Yeah, so neuromusculars. Yeah. Okay. Someone with asthma. Asthma, now. Where they've. Okay. Given up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not asthma with respiratory fatigue. So anyone in respiratory fatigue won't be able to. Okay. So exhaustion. Anyone exhausted is at risk. Okay. Which one? Fragile chest. Fragile chest, as in. As in like broken ribs. Oh, broken ribs. Oh, oh, flail chest, like. Yes. Yeah, All right. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyone who's got a, so any deformity in the chest, so kyphoscoliosis, <coughs> any congenital deformities, things like that. Um, if you've had trauma to the chest, yeah, that could Im impair your ventilation. And then you know about obesity hyperventilation syndrome. You know about that. Basically, really fat, physically compressed yeah, the chest. Pickwickian. Yeah. They call it Pickwickian as well. Yeah. So why do people who are given high flow oxygen, why do some of them retain CO2? What's actually going on? <laughs> the hypoxic drive theory was debunked in 2009. It's in the BTS um, publication they've done. It's just not the explanation at all. It's been shown that when you give people with COPD or these people at risk of hypercapnic failure, when you give them high flow oxygen, their ventilation rate is exactly the same. Can someone just talk me through ventilation for fusion matching? What's going on in normal health? You're getting blood supply to the alveoli, which are also getting ventilated. Perfect, exactly right. So in normal health, you've got some alveoli which are better ventilated than others and we have more blood going to the better ventilated ones. And the way the body does that is it looks at the oxygen in the alveoli, does hypoxic vasoconstriction to the rubbish ones, which means the good, the good alveoli get the best blood. Okay. If you now give everyone, so normally you can see how you've um, made sure that the blood is going to well-ventilated alveoli only, okay, well, predominantly. Um, if you then give someone high flow oxygen, what's gonna happen to the number of alveoli which are well oxygenated? Increase. Yeah, so you're going to so it's going to be you're going to lose that um, selection, aren't you? They're all going to be above that critical minimum. Okay, so you get blood flow spread more evenly throughout the lungs. Okay, so it's no longer doing a good ventilation perfusion matching anymore. It's just 
spread evenly. Okay. And in terms of oxygen, that's okay because all the alveoli are well oxygenated, so that's probably not that bad a problem. But in terms of CO2, remember CO2 is dependent on ventilation, right? And if you now have blood going to rubbish ventilated um, alveoli, what's going to happen to your CO2? It's going to Yeah, exactly. You, you, it's, it's almost like you're not ventilating because your blood's not going to the ventilated alveoli. It's affecting the same thing, isn't it? So if you give most people high flow oxygen, this happens to everyone, right? But the reason you see it in COPD and you see it in obesity and neuromuscular and the rest of it is because these people don't have the capacity to compensate for that raised CO2 by ventilating more. BTS splits your oxygen requirements into two groups, those at risk and those not at risk. The ones not at risk, your target is 94 to 98. The ones at risk is 88 to 92. Okay, cool. This patient, at risk, not at risk? No. Not at risk, yeah, there's, there's nothing in the history to suggest actually she's at risk. So what would your target sets be? Perfect, yeah, cool. Uh, 65-year-old man admitted with an infective exacerbation. Last admitted two months ago for a similar problem. It had to be managed by NIV. Okay, we just stop there for a second. What, what does that tell you already? The fact he had to be managed by NIV. What? The fact he was managed on NIV two months ago. What does that tell you? It means you've got to take it seriously. It means, yeah, just wake up. Yeah, this is serious. So That's one thing. So you're worried. You're already stressed. Okay, fine. You're more stressed. The fact he had to be managed by NIV showed that he did go into hypercapnic failure. So this is a guy who was at risk, automatically, we know that. Does that make sense? So you'd be a lot more cautious. Okay, he's unwell but stable. The reason I've written that is so that you don't have to bump them on high flow oxygen <coughs> because they're not unstable, okay? What should his target saturations be? Less than 92%. Less than 92, all the way down? Just anything below 92? 88 yeah. 92. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. FM. Yeah, otherwise <laughs> just let me die. Um, okay, cool. So you put it on four litres, you've got this picture. Can someone just talk me through this one a bit? The pH is okay. pH is okay? It's yeah. Four it's on four litres of oxygen, okay. So it's, yeah. Oxygen, yeah, what do you think? Oxygen is fine. So it's a bit low because it's on four litres of oxygen. Oh, that's yeah. interesting, okay. Yeah, compared to what he's on, it's This is interesting, great. yeah, okay. So how are you going to adjust what he's on to work out if he's got... There's a really simple way, actually. You can just take the percentage, okay, of oxygen in the inspired air, minus, minus 10. 10. That'll do. So Okay, so he's, he's slightly low for, for the amount that's coming in, but at the same time, he's well oxygenated from that, okay. CO2. High. Yeah, it's a bit high. Um, terrifying, worrying, probably okay. He's alright. Pro probably he's alright, yeah, probably. What makes you more, more reassured in the blood gas? pH. pH, exactly. If you look at the BTS guidance, Okay, I'm not going to say they don't care about hypercapnia, but if your patient's hypercapnic without having, without being acidotic, that's fine, they never ventilate that. Okay, they might just say, all they say is titrate the oxygen down, okay, 1892, and you can continue titrating it down as long as PO2 stays uh, above 8 kilopascals. Okay, so do you notice they don't actually, that's not an indication for ventilation in itself. Okay, so that, that's fine, okay. Why has he got a base excess which is positive and an HCO3 which is a bit high? Metabolic compensation. And generally metabolic compensation is slow and um, respiratory acidosis and alkalosis is fast, right? So what this often represents, especially in COPD, is a chronic compensation they've had for, for months, years even maybe, um, where they've generally been hyperventilating a little bit. So they all, not they all, but some of them develop a chronic um, metabolic compensation to allow them to deal with a bit of uh, respiratory acidosis. Okay, so if you get an ABG, if you've got no history, your patient comes unconscious and you see that their um, acid their PCO2 is high, um, but they've compensated ridiculously well, even you know, sometimes they can still be even alcohol, it can go really far the other way. It makes you suspicious. This is a patient who's long-term retaining CO2, you know? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so when you said titrate for 88 to 92, the nurse misheard that as turn it up to 8 litres and leave it there. Happens. Um, the nurse then bleeps you as a patient seems drowsy two hours later. Your blood gas on 8 litres is like this. Okay, so... <clears throat> uh, worried, not worried? Worried. Yeah, maybe, maybe a bit more. Um, but, but the pH is, pH is actually okay. So, 
yeah, you, it's it's stupid and you need to turn the oxygen down, but I'm not terrified. The patient's actually going to be okay. We think. So it's gone up. We can see what's happening. It does kind of um, support the hypothesis this guy is oxygen sensitive. Okay. But, um, yeah, we can probably, probably sort this out by turning it down. So you turn it down to two litres a minute. Uh, you come back in three hours and you do another ABG. And this time you've got this. Now I it. Now you're worried. Okay. Sure. Now what do you do? The oxygen's also gone to 8.4, so mm. you might need to turn the oxygen back up. Yeah, okay. Is this patient going to, even if I give him more oxygen, do you think at this stage it's going to fix the problems? I mean, we've got, we've got a problem where if we turn it up, we're doomed. If we turn it down, we're doomed. We're kind of screwed both ways with the oxygen, aren't we? Um, so, what, what do you think? Is there anything kind of in terms of the oxygen? Do you think the, the, okay, but this way, do you think the final fix is going to be an oxygen level? Do you think there's going to be a magic one which will work? No, so there's going to be something else coming on board, right? What's that something else? Bicarb. Which one? Bicarb. Bicarb. Um, we can find source of them. Okay, so we'll go through them. So first, bicarb. Bicarb um, usually. Okay, I see what you mean. Just try and make him al more alkalotic. Fortunately, bicarb is one that is a horrible thing to give IV. It's, you know, it comes. It's a. It comes as sodium bicarb with loads of sodium in it. Um, it's high osmolar stuff. It messes up your osmolarity of everything. It's a big sodium load, and it. It can, it can improve the extracellular acidosis, usually at the price of intracellular acidosis. It can make it worse. The general indication for bicarb is if you're so acidotic that you're actually depressing the cardiac function, that's like one of the complications of acidosis. When your pH is below 7.2, your contractility of the heart goes down. That might be an indication for bicarb. If you've got resistant hyperkalemia, that might be an indication for bicarb. Apart from that, generally steer clear. Okay, It's something that a senior dude will come involved and decide about. As an F1, F2, you never make that decision about bicarb. Um, oh, except um, tricyclic um, antidepressant uh, overdose, then bicarb is, I suppose, and if you're correcting the arrhythmia on ACG there, you would actually use bicarb. Okay, so then probably you could do it yourself. Um, okay, fine. So you want to fix it. It's not going to be to do with an oxygen level. Okay. Anything else? Remember, we, what, did the, what happened to him last time? What do we do? He was a red Yeah, an IV. So what do you think we're going to do now? Then yeah, exactly. So the fix when you get to the stage where there's no oxygen level, which makes sense, is to NIV or, or inv either invasive or non-invasive ventilation, one or two. Generally, um, you go for NIV in a slightly um, more healthy, more fit... Um, okay, well, if they're really unfit, you, wouldn't even, you might not even do any of them. Um, but NIV, you generally be patients who you think can come out of this. Um, do you see what I mean? Uh, generally had good function before. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's the decision between NIV and invasive ventilation. Something a senior can make based on comorbidities, patients' quality of life before, etc., etc., and the degree of re re reversibility. Okay, so yeah, um, NIV or invasive Ooh. ventilation is probably going to not make it.